This conference will now be recorded. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first virtual presentation on our snare removal work that is the cornerstone project of our wildlife re rescue and rehabilitation program at Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust. Thanks very much for taking the time out of your busy day to join us for this conversation. We're very happy to have you with us. I'm Tracy Butcher. I am the U.S. Development and Outreach Director for Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust. I'm based in Cocoa, Florida, and officially joined this amazing organization in January of this year. I went to Zimbabwe in 1988 to do research in conservation biology and wildlife management and stayed for 15 years working in community-based natural resource management. I've known some of the trust's founders and staff for more than 30 years, and I can attest personally to their passion and commitment to protecting Africa's iconic wildlife. It's remarkable the blood, sweat, and tears, and personal finances these people have contributed that has gone into creating what is now the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust. I'm very, very proud to be part of this team. Before I introduce Roger Perry, let me just ask that if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the questions box located typically in the right side of your dashboard. After the presentation, we'll address questions queued and then open the floor for discussion if time allows. We are having some technical difficulties at the moment. Hopefully they will be sorted out by the time we get to the question and answer session. If they're not, um, please do feel free to contact uh, any of us with questions um, when you do receive this presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce all of you to Roger Perry. Roger is the Wildlife and Research Manager for the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust. He's been with the Trust since its inception and has more than 25 years experience in wildlife conservation and 15 years experience in the wildlife tourism industry. Roger spent 10 years working for the Zimbabwe Department of National Parks and Wildlife Management, where he ascended to the rank of Senior Warden for Chisarira National Park, which, and was responsible for anti-poaching, game capture and management, fire and water supply management, and he was also um, flew for national parks on occasion. For the trust, Roger oversees the community outreach programs and all of the wildlife research. He oversees our human wildlife conflict project, our carnivore research, our elephant mitigation, vulture research and rehabilitation, and the litter team. And he also works very, very closely with the Victoria Falls anti-poaching unit. The majority of Roger's time is spent darting snared and injured animals in the region and assists wherever he's needed by local wildlife authorities and partners throughout Botswana and Zambia. And with Roger, without further ado, go ahead and um, take over and we look forward to your presentation. Oh, thanks, Tracy. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, today's presentation is going to be on uh, the level of African uh, wildlife. Um, Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, our presentation is going to be uh, on snare removal of African wildlife. I'll be talking for about 20 minutes or so, and uh, then we will um, go into a question phase uh, after the presentation. What is a snare? It is a type of trap similar to a lasso. It is usually made of wire and attached to a tree or a log. Poachers place these wire snares uh, in the paths where elephants, uh, where animals walk. Uh, they may normally put it up in the vertical pan, um, and uh, so the animals actually walk in. Being a lasso, it uh, tightens around one, um, some part of the body of the animal and uh, gets tighter and tighter. 
when the animal walks into it, the wire snare tightens around the neck, the trunk, leg, or snout, getting tighter and tighter as it struggles. Often these animals will break free of the wire or break the wire itself off the tree or the log when it is uh, struggling. The wire remains on the animal, sometimes getting tighter and tighter, until the animal can't walk, eat, breathe, paint, depending on the location of the snare. These snares uh, inflict horrible injuries and sometimes a slow and very painful uh, death. We have great partners uh, that we work with. The Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority, Big Falls anti Unit, tourism sector within Victoria Falls, and concerned individuals that assist us. They help look for these animals that have been injured with wire snares or may even be still attached to the tree or dragging a log. These stakeholders will call us when these compromised animals are seen injured or with a snare. And then they will stay with that animal and monitor that animal until we can actually get there on the ground. When we get this call, we literally drop everything and we load our equipment and respond to that location. Once there, we make an assessment of the situation. We decide what dialing system to use, how to approach the animal, what drug combination and what drugs to use, what doses for that particular animal? Is that animal compromised? Is, is it young? Is it old? What is the condition of that animal? We have two choices of different darting systems that we can use and a variety of different veterinary drugs for different species. The darting system depends on the species of animal, for example, an elephant with a very really thick skin, we need a, a, a dart with a very really long needle and also with a little bit more power. Whereas if we're darting a zebra, we have to be careful because they are fairly thin-skinned animals. And the, the darting system that we use needs to be softer and uh, not to damage that, that animal. It also depends on the circumstances. If we are darting from a helicopter, a heavier dart is required. Uh, then when we would use the same um, species uh, on the same species on the ground, uh, we would use a slightly softer hitting dart. The doses used are dependent on the type of animal, gender, metabolism, and age. Some of the veterinary drugs we are using are harmful to humans, so we have to be very careful when we are handling these medications. Once the animal has been darted, it can take somewhere up to between 5 and 20 minutes for that animal to go down. And you can imagine in that time that animal can move and, and into thick bush and uh, out of sight. So we have to monitor that animal very carefully. The time to mobilization depends on the medication we use and the darting placement, whether it's intramuscular, intravenous, subcutaneous. These are all variations uh, that can, can take place when we are from these animals. Sometimes certain species need physical restraint, as well as chemical immobilization to help ensure it goes down smoothly. For example, a giraffe uh, needs to be darted. The immobilization drugs are work fairly quickly. And we need to get that animal down as quickly as possible. So we use ropes to actually uh, um, get that animal down so that we can give the antidote as quickly as possible. And then we keep that animal on the ground while we actually work on it and remove the stairs and carry out the veterinary work. After the animal is done, we check to make sure it is completely mobilized and for the safety of our team. You can imagine if we dart a dangerous animal like an elephant or a buffalo, uh, we want to make sure that that animal is mobilized because if we walk up, it, up to it and, and it's it, it, it still, um, still away, 
We stabilize animal in terms of uh, position and breathing, making sure that animal is comfortable and in the, in the right position. Sometimes they fall against trees, sometimes um, down onto a rock or something like that. We make sure that animal is in a, a good position. Elephants, for example, need to be on their side, uh, lateral recumbent. Um, this is because of the weight of the ele elephant. If it's lying on its chest, it can't breathe properly. So we have to roll that animal over uh, to, to make sure that it's on its side. Other species, including ungulates, need to be on their sternum. It's, that's on their chest. Um, this, this is um, uh, to, uh, because of rumination to prevent regurgitation and bloating. If that animal stays on the side too long, it could actually be compromised. And so we need to get it onto its sternum. Once all that, all that is done, we, we make sure that there's a blindfold placed over the eyes uh, to reduce stimulation and protect the eyes from sunlight and from uh, dust, etc., during the mobilization process. Once the animal is immobilized, um, stabilized, blindfolded, we then attend to the snare and any wounds of injuries caused by the wire. If the snare is not broken, broken the skin, this is often a very simple task and just requires us cutting the wire off that animal. We will obviously check that animal for any other wounds, etc., during that same process and continue the process of the mobilization exercise. This, may, this whole process of assessment, if the snare has cut into the skin, a serious assessment of the injury has to be done to determine uh, in terms of recovery viability of the animal. This may require a veterinarian to make that this assessment, depending on the injury. Many of the immobilization drugs we use have negative side effects, and constant monitoring of that animal needs to be done while it is mobilized. The ground team members will monitor the respiration, blood pressure, and sometimes a pulse oximeter will be used to monitor oxygen saturation of the blood. Uh, and, and also the heart rate as well. These are all ways that we can monitor the progress of that animal while it's been, um, been uh, mobilized. If the temperature increases, uh, we use water to cool that, the body of the animal down. Some of the drugs we use interferes with the ability to regulate temperature, body temperature, uh, and therefore we have to make sure that the animal does not overheat. Once the wire has been removed, we then clean up the wound, apply antibiotics if required for infection, apply wound spray to keep the, the flies out of the injury, and in some cases, we treat, treat with an anti inflammatory. With every mobilization, we take samples of blood from the animal to run back in the laboratory. We do have a wildlife uh, laboratory here. We can run the blood and to make an assessment of, of the animal's health. And of course, once once we've finished all that, we remove the dart, clean the dart wound, and the, and uh, and um, yeah, just treat the dart wound. After the animal has been treated and the samples are taken, it is now time to reverse the veterinary medications and wake up the animal. Not all veterinary medications can be reversed, therefore careful consideration must be given initially when deciding on what dose and drugs to give the animal. For some species, including animals like carnivores and primates, this is not an, there is not an antidote for the main knockdown drug. We can, however, have an antidote for some of the sedatives we use in combination with those immobilizing drugs. This, by, by reversing some of these sedatives, 
uh, we are able to improve the reversal process. We, are, we, we then ask the ground team to move away from the animal and back, back to safety area of a vehicle, um, away from any harm uh, once the animal wakes up. Some of these animals can wake up within three minutes, so we, everybody needs to be moved away. And also, they need to connect all the equipment, make sure everything is collected um, and uh, taken away. If the antidote is for sedatives, some, some of the recovery time is a lot slower. Um, we can also introduce the, um, the drug. Uh, it's normally introduced into the uh, intravenously, um, into the air or into a vein in the leg, um, or intramuscularly. Intramuscularly allows the capture team a little bit more time, about five to 10 minutes, um, to, move away, to move away from that animal. If the antidote is for sedatives, the recovery time is a lot slower, as I said. After the antidote is given, we continue to uh, remotely uh, monitor the animal, making sure its respiration is maintained and the time for its wake up, uh, standing up and recovery. This is a process that varies for every animal animal circumstances, the age, the size, the health, condition, and safety of the ground team. Records must be kept. You can imagine what, using the drugs, we need to keep all the, the records uh, of the whole process from start to finish. Sometimes we, we have to seek alternative means to get close to that animal, such as using horseback, helicopter, by foot, or by vehicle. For example, darting an animal from a single herd of buffalo in a herd of about 100 buffalo, um, getting close to a draft as well can also be a, a challenge. So we need to um, think about ways of actually being able to serve and get, uh, get as close as we can to those animals. All the time, safety is our priority. We do carry um, human antidotes for the drugs that we use. And also a professional guide is, is uh, present um, to back up for safety. It is always important to remember that the animals that, that are snare, snared and injured and are, are often in, not in great condition, they will be more likely to be aggressive than in normal situations. Any compromised animal will feel more threatened by you coming into the presence of that animal and therefore the likelihood of, of uh, them um, charging uh, is, is quite high. So a lot of care needs to be taken place when we do approach these animals. The ultimate question, of course, is why do people snare? Poverty and subsistence is a key driver of snare, snare poaching in Zimbabwe. There are high levels of unemployment and currently, the drought situation and the challenging economic uh, situation here in Zimbabwe are impacting the most marginalized people. They are, that they are snaring to feed the families. However, snaring can also be commercial. We have repeated offenders who target buffalo and elephant to commercially uh, sell the meat for a source of income. Many of these people then escalate their illegal activities and turn to malicious poisoning of elephants for ivory and commercial poaching of key species, including elephant and rhino and pangolin. You know, all know the threat that we have today on the, on the rhino in this part of the world. Um, and this is dr driven by these uh, people that are, are using these poachers to, uh, for, for greed and selling uh, the products at uh, high, um, high revenue gain. Education plays a pivotal role in ensuring people understanding the benefits of wildlife and do not illegally, not turn to illegal snare poaching to, to survive. Penalties on poaching are dependent on the species poached. For example, the penalty for poaching an elephant, of course, will be much higher than poaching a, 
and another one like an impala. Thank you all for participating in this evening. We really appreciate your support. Please feel free to share this message with other people and spread awareness about the snare poaching. Here are just a few more ways you can help make a difference in wildlife and conservation. Stay in touch. Be a conscientious consumer. Visit our website. We've got a lot of information there um, of all sorts of things. Visit us if you come to Zimbabwe. We'd love to have, uh, see you. Um, give us a call if you are coming and uh, so that we are aware that you are. Most of all, thanks very much for watching this presentation. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, Roger, thanks for the great and inspiring presentation. Um, I'd like to thank all of our friends and colleagues and donors all over the globe who are making this important work very possible. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any more questions or if you would like any information. And of course, please do support this work if you are able and so inclined. We can't do this without you. And um, Roger, what I was saying is we do have one question from a gentleman in Texas who's wondering, what is the survivability of um, these animals that you do release after you take a snare off of them? Do you have any way of knowing how they do once once they're released? Yes, absolutely, Tracy. It's, um, you know, what we have learned over the years is that these animals are extremely resilient. Um, some really, really are bad cases, uh, and each individual case is different. Um, some really bad cases, we've monitored these animals over time and they bounce back, you know, we are there purely to help these animals. Uh, we mobilize them, we remove the cause, we treat them as much as we can, we then reverse them and they're back um, into the wild. And it's up to them after that. And we find that they do recover quite nicely um, uh, once we remove um, that cause. Um, so the, in most cases, the um, prognosis is very positive. Good. That's great. Um, I think that's all for now. You've covered this other question. Um, Let's see here. And we did have we did have some technical issues. So um, we didn't have a, um, a great audience today, unfortunately. We will share this taped recording with everybody and um, we will fix our technical issues for the next webinar. But in the meantime, we hope you enjoy this outreach and do not um, hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. Roger, thanks from thanks to all of you in Zimbabwe helping us uh, make this happen today. Thanks very much, Tracy, and thanks for your time. Okay, bye then. Bye, everybody.